It's great to see you all here this Sunday morning and those online. We're so glad you could join us. If you'd all stand with me and let's worship together. stands there with open arms just waiting to welcome us home. Just thank you. The cross is my beginning. The line drawn in the sea. Jesus was forsaken, so I will never be. His grace is 
power which is only through you Lord thank you that we can be here because of your resurrection power because everything is finished on the cross already and all we have to do is believe and walk by faith God and know you and become more and more like you Jesus and so today during this time we just ask that you would hear our hearts that you would speak uh, in and through uh, Cameron as he speaks later God and that you would just be glorified here thank you for the opportunity to be here on this Sunday Memorial Weekend in Jesus name we pray and everybody said 
Amen. Wow, thanks. Amen. Have a seat. Have a seat. No, don't have a seat. Sorry. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, I just wanted to welcome you. I'm Margo. I'm on the teaching team here at Crosspoint. And I also want to welcome everybody at home or wherever you are in your smart device. There are lots of people here today, which is great. And we're grateful that you're here. If it's the first time back in a while, welcome. And if you haven't been back in a while, we'd love to have you. Uh, and so uh, we want you to do a little bit of a community time. And so that means you get to find somebody that maybe you don't know really well. But here's the question we want to ask you. What's your favorite grilled food? After all, it's Memorial Weekend, and you can't say brat. Okay, just kidding. Okay. So go ahead. You've got a minute. Good job. As your mouths are now salivating for some good grilled food, you can find your way back to your seat. That's great. I heard hot dogs, hamburgers, chicken, salmon, brats. But you know, uh, Memorial Weekend is what you can have a seat. Uh, Memorial Weekend is way more than just grilled food and picnics and going boating and opening up our cabin and uh, enjoying the weekend together. But it's about um, remembering and pausing and honoring those who died in active military service. And so we want to do that because freedom isn't free. And so all through the weekend, remember what Memorial Day is really about. So we connected with each other. We want you to continue to connect with us. There are connection cards in your seat back in front of you that you can fill out and take to the Next Steps counter. Or you can go to the digital worship guide as well. And you can... Um, look there and you can continue to connect with us on social media be it Facebook or Instagram and so we are the church and we want to do life together there are some highlights actually some ways to be the church and so one of them is the blood drive I know many of you have already signed up for the blood drive it is June 3rd it's in the gym it's from 2 to 7 make sure to go to next steps counter or the digital worship guide to make sure to get your little body in there because I will never forget how I was the recipient of two pints of blood when I really needed it and life-giving blood and so make sure to give your blood for someone that needs life-giving blood so the slots are filling up so thank you for doing that also we're gonna have outdoor services we loved them last year we're gonna have them again this year there will be three June 13th July 18th and August 22nd we'll have amazing worship and they'll be teaching as well and at the uh, June 13th one we want to have games and bring a lunch stay for a while there'll be yard games there'll be fun contest and the kids there will be a um, chalk drawing contest and it will actually be judged by the staff at cross point and then there'll be all kinds of cool prizes so make sure to be there that's june 13th outdoors now usually we have the ushers come up at this time for offering uh, but we have two baskets at the back for offering as well as you can give online at crosspointwi.com but we we love to talk about these generosity axioms and one that means a lot to me is giving is a get to not a got to and the reason that means uh, so much to me is it comes right from Scripture. It comes from 2 Corinthians 9, which says, Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, 
but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. He gives to us, and we just give right back with open hands. So let's pray over our offering. Lord Jesus, thank you that we have this incredible privilege to um, just to show you how much we love you, God, and just to give back. You're the one who's given us the ability to make wealth, and we can just give it right back to you, God, because everything is from you and through you and to you and for you. And so I ask, Lord, that you would do a number in our hearts, Lord Jesus, that we, maybe we're like, we think that we have to. No, it's, it's a get to. We have this amazing privilege to give back to you as an offering of everything that you've done for us and continue to do. And we love you, Jesus. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Now, just before we continue to worship, I want to welcome Pastors Mac and Jody to the platform for an important announcement. Hello, hello. There we go. It's on. Hot mic. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hey, so we as a church, uh, we try to make spirit-led decisions, yeah? We don't do it perfectly, but our goal is to try to discern what is God up to and then say yes to it and join in. And so over the last seven months or so, uh, uh, myself and our elder team have been playing a supportive role uh, kind of behind the scenes giving Jody space to discern what has God up to in the life of the, the Bean family. So it's going to kind of come as shocking news. It's a hard announcement, uh, but one that has been bathed in like seven months of prayer. So it's not my news to share. It's Jody, so take it away. And I wore my tightest pants so that we would match. It's good. Yeah. I feel like I've elevated your clothing You game really today. have. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, seven years, it rubs off. Yeah. Um, <sighs> yeah, so we've been in a long process together, and, and before I dive in, I just want to name uh, my gratitude for, for the elders. I see a bunch of you here, and for Mac. Um, I've experienced a lot of ministry, but something I haven't experienced a lot of is the deep love and uh, integrity of this board, and so I'm so grateful for you guys for holding open this space and really uh, leading with love. Um, so we've been in this process, and for me, it kind of started last summer with um, a sitting with Jesus and sensing this invitation to explore what uh, flourishing would look like for a family. And as I opened that up, we started to explore different variables that maybe would feed into flourishing, and the biggest one for us was family. So we've been at Cross Point for seven years, almost to the day. And when we came, life looked a lot different. We, we were dinks, dual income, no kids, uh, living easy breezy lives, um, and just really excited to be digging into the work at Cross Point. But as time has gone on, our family has grown and things have changed. And we've found that living a thousand miles away from any family has been straining and difficult. And we have a strong desire to be reconnected with our, with our bio families. Uh, secondly, we were a diverse family, and we have a strong desire to be in a, a diverse community that reflects our family. Um, we, we have thin blood, so we would really like to be somewhere slightly warmer. Um, and then we, we began to explore what would it look like for me to step into a lead pastor position. And so we jumped into that vigorously as a process, tons of interviews, tons of interviews, lots of time. Um, even visited some church, uh, a church, and uh, but ultimately, we we didn't have peace moving forward um, with any of those opportunities. And during that whole process, something fell into our lap that was uh, unexpected. Uh, we weren't looking for, but it was an opportunity outside of ministry uh, in a medical device supply company in Richmond, Virginia. Um, and so I've decided to take that position. And there's a couple of reasons that I think are important to clarify, like why the big change, because uh, it was a big change for me, and it's still 
bittersweet. Um, but the first one is this, that I value ministry so much, I'm not willing to jump into any ministry. Um, if I could pick up Crosspoint and move it with me, I would stay indefinitely. Uh, so I have a really high value around what ministry uh, should look like. And so for me, I, I care so much that I'm not willing to simply uh, take a job in ministry to stay in. Um, secondly, uh, the longer the process kind of went on, I did some introspection and started to realize, man, I'm still carrying a lot of uh, wounding and a lot of pain from a lot of years in ministry. Um, I know I'm not unique in this. If you talk to our staff, uh, ministry comes uh, with some shots that are difficult. Um, and I just sense in the season, stepping out for me is a way to uh, uh, s keep my heart soft and to heal. And I sense there's just a lot of grace in that uh, for me and for my family. And so um, I just love you guys. I'm so grateful for my time here. I've been completely changed in these seven years together. Um, uh, I believe in Crosspoint. Uh, I came here believing in the vision of this church. I leave believing in the vision of this church. Uh, I pray for it that God would continue to lead you guys in the same faithful direction. Um, and so I don't leave with any ill feelings. I, I love this place and I love this uh, staff team and this community. Um, we just sense that uh, there's, while it's bittersweet to make all of these changes, this is what it looks like for us to be faithful to move toward uh, a God, a God-sized vision of flourishing for our family. Yeah. Yeah. So this, this just stinks, you know. Um, Jody, he's one of my best friends, and we've done a lot of life together. We've been through uh, the trenches together, and. You know, there's just these moments, you guys, where God gives a vision and it's exciting and everybody can move toward it with joy. And then there's these other moments where God moves and it involves something hard, but you still have to say yes to it. And so my prayer for uh, our community is that we would just see God's hand in Jody, Jody's life and in the Bean family and be able to say yes to that, even though it's, it's hard because you're loved here. You're loved deeply. And... Um, so I would ask for you to, to join in that. Um, we don't have an official end date. It will likely be sometime in July. And we did that intentionally because you guys need to have space with Jody to celebrate and affirm how much he's given. He has poured his life out uh, for our church community. And you've been blessed by his gifting. He's a shepherd. He's got an incredible, a incredible ability to be present to people uh, with the love of Jesus. He's got a really unusual sense of humor that we're going to miss. It's really weird at times, man. Um, but we just love you. And it's, it's hard, but we're excited for you, and we want to say yes. We don't want to cling to you and, like, hold you back. We want to release you to pursue all that God has for you. So I'm going to ask you guys, if you want, you can extend a hand, but we're going to just pray over the Bean family over Jody and uh, our, our future as a church. And so, Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for Jody. We thank you for the gift that he is and all that he's given to us as a church family. We thank you for uh, Ruth and Miri and Maggie and just the gift they are to our community. And as I was praying over uh, this announcement this morning, uh, Jeremiah 29, 11 came to mind, which I'm acutely aware is for the nation of Israel and not for specific individuals. And yet it applies here that you have uh, guided the Bean family and you have plans to prosper them and give them hope and a new future, one that involves flourishing. And so we pray that blessing over them. We pray that you'd uh, be in all the details over the next month as they have to figure out how to sell a home and find a place and all the logistics, would you, would you just pave a smooth path forward? We pray that you would bless Ruth and Jody in their marriage. May this transition do nothing but bring them closer together. Uh, bless them as a family. May this be a new chapter of flourishing in closer proximity to biological family. And would you just give them all that they need to do? We celebrate uh, what we've received. We thank you 
uh, for the way that you use people like Jody to, to strengthen us, to encourage us, to help us become more like Jesus. And we just uh, are in awe and in gratitude of all that you've done in and through him. We pray for our church community that you would continue to give us all that we need. We trust Jody to you and we trust our future to you, knowing that you are a God that is good and gracious and knows what we need and is eager to provide it for us. We ask all of this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Can we thank Jody and give him some love? song together.
ask that uh, we would be aware of your greatness today and this week, uh, how big you are, you're over everything. I gotta ask that you would help us uh, just be open to your word and the work you wanna do in our lives, not just understanding it, but also living it out um, this week with the people around us, with coworkers, with um, just all the people in our lives. So we thank you so much for your love and your grace. It's in your name we pray, amen. You guys can have a seat. Uh, we are, my name is Cameron, uh, pastor of family life here at Cross Point. work with students, which is a ton of fun. Um, we are in the middle of the book of James. If you've been around, you know this. Uh, uh, we are in kind of a long section where he's talking about like kind of reinforcing this idea that faith without action is dead. Faith without works is dead. Now, if you've been around here for the last couple of weeks, you have heard this idea before, because this is kind of a long section in Scripture. So what I want to, it can be tempting when you've heard something before to be like, oh, cool, now I can make my grocery list, you know, I can answer all the emails I need to answer. Yeah, I've heard this before. Um, but I want to say that there's a lot of time devoted to this in the book of James uh, because it is so important for us to understand. And it is so important for us to actually live out in our lives. So maybe you're like, okay, I kind of get it up here. Uh, maybe be open to the ways this morning that God might be prompting you to actually like live some of this stuff out in the relationships around you and in the people around you. Um, so I want to uh, kind of zoom out a little bit and also maybe share a little bit about why I think this message that faith without action is so important for us to understand and to actually live out in this day and age. So in our post-Christian world, even believing the things about Jesus in the Bible is like a radical thing to do, right? There are so many people that are either have walked away from faith or just don't believe in God, don't believe any of this stuff uh, that we say we believe. And so what can happen because of that is if you do believe that, you can kind of lull yourself into a false sense of like uh, superiority or like, oh yeah, I'm doing pretty good. It's kind of like when I really don't want to mow my lawn and I can be like drive through my neighborhood and be like, oh good, their lawn is worse than mine. At least it's not as bad as theirs. So I, I'm doing pretty good. Or like when my kids are crazy, it's like, well, at least they're not as crazy as those kids over there. Or at least my grades aren't as bad as this person over here. And that same thing can happen with us, happen to us as followers of Jesus, is because we already are so far ahead in some ways, it can be tempting to just kind of sit back and be like, okay, cool, I'm doing pretty good. I don't have to really worry about this too much. Like, I don't have to live this radical life that Jesus has called us to, because like, I'm doing better than like, I don't know, 60 or 70% of the people in our country anyway. Um, but the problem with that is that James just shared in the passage from last week, it's, it was like, when I first read this verse, it is like stuck with me my entire life, where he says, yeah, you believe in Jesus, that's great. Even demons believe in Jesus. So like just believing the right things about God is not enough. Like that's not what faith is. Um, and there are many people walking around with what James calls a dead faith in this passage. Faith without action, he calls it a dead faith. Believing all the right things, but not actually having the actions or the deeds or the works to go along with it. Now we have talked uh, kind of in this section of James a lot about the, the outside stuff, like taking care of widows and orphans and the, and the uh, most vulnerable people and like, you know, our faith being like oriented towards our family and the people around us. So today I want to spend a little bit of time thinking like internally, Right, because our faith is not just for the sake of other people. While your faith is supposed to affect other people, and you are supposed to love your family, you are supposed to love uh, all the people that Jesus would love, your faith is not first and foremost about loving other people. Like you can get so caught up in doing things for God, we actually forget to spend any time with God. Um, and so your, God's first call on your life is ultimately to be friends with him. Right? He calls us into relationship, not just into a job or into being a servant. He calls us to be in relationship with him. And authentic friendship and relationship uh, requires action and time spent. Like I think of, you know, I have friends from high school that I haven't seen for probably like seven or eight years, but I kind of hear what's happening in their life, either because of Facebook or I talk to another friend. 
Uh, knowing those facts about them is not a replacement for the relationship. Like, we haven't talked in years, so there's no, like, real relationship there anymore. And it's the same way with God. Like, knowing facts about God is not the same thing as being in relationship with God. So many people are walking around with a dead faith and then wondering why God feels so distant. Why it feels like God doesn't care. Why it feels like God isn't there for us. Right, we get too busy, um, work schedules, like all the busyness of life comes on. So we kind of push off connecting with God and then kind of ask this question, why does God feel so distant? Why don't I feel close to God anymore like I used to feel? Well, you haven't paused your busy life long enough to even spend any time drawing closer to him. Uh, it's kind of like if, it, you know, you stop going to the gym and then wonder like, well, why am I gaining weight again? It's not the gym's fault right? It's your fault. Like, it's not God's fault that he feels distant when we put him on hold for weeks on end and never carve out any time to spend with him. Like, he is waiting all, at all times, waiting for us to draw closer to him because he is there, like, waiting to be in relationship with us. Um, so what I've seen is that faith, like, lived out with our works, like, backed up by action, isn't just, like, the correct answer from the book of James. It's also life-giving in a way that dead faith is not. Okay, like, I think of, um, so one of the things I do for, like, my devotional time uh, is, like, in reading God's word. So I have, like, two small kids, so finding time can sometimes feel a little crazy or impossible. So what I've started doing is just choosing a book of the Bible and deciding, like, okay, anytime I have, like, even, like, five minutes to spend with God, I'm going to just, like, read this book of the Bible. That way I don't have to, like, get re-caught up on, like, so what does this book mean? What's even happening in this thing? Because sometimes the Bible can be a little confusing. So, like, right now I'm reading through the book of First John. So anytime I have time, I just, like, go to where I was in First John and keep reading it. So this year I've probably read First John, I don't know, like 20, 25 times, something like that, which is awesome because then when I go to read it, it's like oh, I already kind of know what to expect, what's happening, like, I, like some of my questions I've already figured out the answers for. But like yesterday, I spent some time reading just like the first couple chapters. That was all I had time for. Uh, and I noticed something. Even though I knew exactly what was in those chapters, I had already read them a lot. I could have probably told you like what some of the information was, what the facts were about them. Carving out time, like having the action to carve out time and create space with God to hear from him, to listen to him, to connect with him, like was life-giving in a totally different way than just knowing facts about that book of the Bible. I've noticed this my entire life. So the bottom line for this uh, passage that we're about to read uh, comes straight from like there's some word play in the Greek text, and it's this. Faith that works. The book, oh, no. Faith that doesn't work doesn't work. That if your faith is not working itself out in action, it just does not work. It doesn't work for other people, and it sure as heck does not work for you either. So we're going to read this passage. We're going to read like a couple chunks at a time um, and just talk about them as we go. So the first one is just one verse, verse 20. Uh, he says, you foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? So James starts this section of this bigger section uh, saying that he is going to prove that this concept is true. And how he's going to do that is he's going to point to like two Old Testament stories that he's about to talk about. Um, this is kind of like, you know, if in America when people like point back to the Constitution or the Founding Fathers, like saying like, hey, there's something important about these stories that happened a long time ago. So first one is Abraham. Okay, Abraham was a guy in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis. It's a little bit after creation, after the flood. And God comes to Abraham one day and says, uh, hey, Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Hey, a great people, uh, I'm going to bless you and through you, like all the nations on earth will be blessed. I'm going to lead you to a new land that you're going to live in. So Abraham had no idea where he was going. Right? Didn't know how long it was going to take to go to get there. God just says, hey, Abraham, you need to pack up and you're going to leave and I'm going to show you where to go as we go. Right? Which is kind of crazy to think about. Like just moving like across the known world at that time to go to this new place not knowing where he was going or any of the details along the way. Uh, how he was going to get there. It required a lot of trust in God. You know, I imagine like anytime there's kind of like a fork in the road, you're like, 
okay, God, like, which way are we going now? Or when, like, food is maybe starting to run out or bandits are on the road. You know, like, trusting that God is going to make things work, that this land that they're going to go to is truly going to be better than the home that he was coming from. Uh, So it required a lot of trust. He didn't know all the details. One thing he did know is that if he was going to create a nation, God was going to create a nation through Abraham out of his family, he probably needed a kid. And at this point, him and his wife, Sarah, were pretty old and had not had kids, so didn't think they could have kids. Um, But God worked a miracle in their life. They had a lot of big screw-ups along the way. Like if you read the book of Genesis, you'll see Abraham gets it wrong a lot. Uh, But God is still with him and faithful even when he's messing things up, trying to force his own way into God's plan. Uh, But eventually um, God comes and he makes Sarah become pregnant with a kid, and this kid's name is Isaac. Okay, and this kid Isaac was the, was the child through which, like, all these promises that Abraham had heard were going to come true. Like, through Isaac, there'd be this nation, and God would, like, like build up this people and create a new, like, land for them to be in. Um, and through them, they'd be a blessing to all the other nations on earth. And then, one day, God comes to Abraham, maybe you've heard this story before, and says, Hey, Abraham, I want you to take Isaac up onto a mountain and sacrifice him. So here Isaac was like the sign of his, God's promise, the hope of what God had promised was going to happen. He says, I want you to take him up to a mountain, and I want you to sacrifice him. Um, now, so they, they go to this mountain that they're supposed to go to. They hike up to the top. And just as Abraham is about to sacrifice his son on this altar, God comes to him and says to stop. He says, now I know you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And God provides an animal to be sacrificed. Now, this is a huge part of Abraham's story. Like if we were reading like the the spark notes or the cliff notes version of the book of Genesis, this would definitely be in there for the test. Um, And the book of Hebrews actually helps shed some light on what was happening for Abraham in this moment. So this is from the book of Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. So if you go back and look at the book of Genesis where the story originally happens, you even see this in there, like that Abraham tells the servants as they about, they're about to walk up the mountain, he says, hey, me and the boy are going to be back. We're going to come back down. So Abraham had this faith um, that, that God was going to like still continue his promises through Isaac, even if it meant bringing him back from the dead. So here's what James says about this uh, in, cha- in verses 21 through 24. He says, was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. There's one more for this one, too. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. So Abraham's faith was more than just the belief that God existed. It was also a trust and a radical belief that God was for him. And some of this is like birthed out of years of traveling through the desert with God, learning to trust God day in and day out for what direction they're going to go next or what they need next while they're out in the desert. Um, And I love that the book of James kind of shows that there's a relational component to this too. That Abraham is called God's friend by trusting God. His trust in God and his uh, relationship with God was so real that it affected how he lived his life. Right, his faith and his actions were working together. In order for these things to be real, they need to show up in the real life, or in our real life, in the real world. It's kind of like, maybe you've had this experience, where you go, to, you're at a grocery store or something, and you see someone maybe you haven't seen for a while, right, and you talk for a couple minutes, and then what do you say at the end? Hey, we should get together soon. Right, like, if you don't actually spend time to get together, that's just a nice thought. It's not anything real about that statement unless there's actually action behind it. 
In the same way, uh, if our faith is just things like, yeah, I really should try to connect with God, or I really should trust God with my life. Yeah, I really should start praying more. I really should start, like, you know, carving out more time in my week to spend time with God. Like, none of that is real unless it actually shows up in your actual life. It's just a nice thought otherwise. Like, don't get me wrong, it's a nice thought. But if it doesn't show up, it's not real faith. Now, the, uh, so for Abraham, his faith and his actions were working together. That's what James is saying, kind of proving that. Now, our next story from the Old Testament is kind of like the opposite of Abraham. So if Abraham is like the ultimate, like kind of the father of the Israelite nation of the Jewish people, uh, this next person, her name is Rahab. So it takes place a little later. Um, you know, God was about to lead uh, the Israelite nation that has now developed and grown and become huge into this promised land that he had promised Abraham a long time ago. Rahab was an outsider, like in every sense of the word. Um, so she was not an Israelite, not part of like God's chosen people that he was going to use to bless the rest of the earth. She was a woman, which not saying anything against women, but in that culture, women were kind of viewed as, as further down the totem pole than men. And she was also, we find out, she was a prostitute, right? So her, her, even her profession was not God-honoring. So she lived in a place called Jericho. Uh, it was this big walled city. Maybe you've heard of it or like watched a Veggie Tales uh, cartoon about it at some point in your life. Uh, about five miles from the Jordan River. Um, and one day... You know, you looked out, and you could, see, you could see the Jordan River from the city of Jericho. It's kind of like on a hill a little bit down into the banks of the river. And there's this giant army on the other side of the Jordan River. Now, the Jordan River was nothing to sneeze at. It was like a mile wide at this point, so a very big river. Jericho had very big, strong walls. Um, and some people probably felt safe knowing, like, oh, cool, there's an army out there, but we got our walls, we got our river, like, life is good, everything's great for us. Um, but Rahab knew something else was going on. Okay, word travels fast, even without social media. Uh, we see that, like, the word had spread that these people, there was something different about them, right? That, that their, their God that was following them had more power than any of the other gods of that time. Um, and they had heard stories about how God parted the Red Sea and defeated the Egyptian army. And how God had just led them to, like, defeat these other armies and kingdoms on the other side of the river, um, and so Rahab knew something else was going on. And when the spies from the Israelite army came to check out the land, check out Jericho, kind of see what was going to happen, Rahab struck a deal with them. She said, I know your God will be able to help this city. Like, I know, I know he's going to, or I know he's going to be able to take this city. And so I'm asking for your help. If I help you, will you help me? Right, will you keep my family safe? Because I know your God, even with the river and the walls and everything, I know your God is going to be able to take this city. Now she ends up lying to the king of Jericho's men. So the king of the city is like, hey, I think the spies went in here. Where'd they go? And she's like, oh, they went that way. And really she was like hiding them up on the roof at the time. Um, protected them. They made it back to the camp. And then when the city is destroyed, like they, uh, they rescue Rahab from the city uh, before everything is destroyed. So here's what James says about Rahab in verse 25 and 26. Remember, he's proving here that faith requires action in order for it to be real and alive. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Now, when I first read this, my first thought was like, wait, how is she considered righteous for lying to the king, right? That seems like kind of like something's not quite adding up here. But what James is pointing out, what he's highlighting here is that she put her intellectual belief that God was going to be able to take the city uh, into action. Like if you read her story, you see that other people also believed like, oh, like this God is a little scarier than other armies that we faced. But they didn't do anything about it. They just kind of sat there afraid and wondered like, well, I wonder what's going to happen when the army gets there. But she actually put her faith and her belief that this God was more powerful than the river or the walls into action and did something about it. So they, her faith and actions were working together. She was saved from the siege of the city and welcomed into a new community and a new way of life and a new people. 
Uh, she was in a part of like the lineage like leading to Jesus. She was part of God's like overarching story of redemption. All because she took this intellectual belief that there was something different about this God and put it into action and did something about it. Rahab's faith was life-changing not because she had strong convictions or because she believed all the right things about God, but because it changed how she actually lived her life. Uh, when I was uh, around 19, I think, so I moved out with a couple friends, um, kind of like bet- I was going to community college, so still living at home. It's my friend Dan and my friend Pedro. Um, any story that starts with, so I was with my friend Pedro is usually going to end in a ridiculous place. Uh, my dad, I'm sure you all have friends like that too. Uh, my dad called it our, so we lived there for six months, got so sick of each other, we moved back home. My dad called it our six month sleepover, which is kind of basically what it was. Um, and so, you know, we did all sorts of crazy stuff. I was going to school, they kind of ended up dropping out and they were working, uh, at a gas station late into the night. And one night I'm laying in bed. It's like after midnight, I think. I think I'm asleep. And they burst through my door. They're like, hey, let's go to the beach. I was like, what is happening right now? Uh, So we lived, I'm from the Portland area. So like to drive to the beach is like an hour and a half, two hour drive away. I was like, midnight, it's like two hour. It's like, even if we just drive there and come right back, like I'm not getting home until four or five in the morning. Like I have class tomorrow. They're like, no, come on. It's going to be awesome. I was like, no, no, I can't do it. And then this is how easy I am to convince to do something fun. They're like, look, it's 1234. One, two, three, four. The stars are aligned. It's a sign. I was like, well, you've got a point now. Like, let's do this. <laughs> so we're in the car. We're driving to the beach. And, and I'm like, you know what? If we're doing it, like, let's just do it. Like, instead of going straight down the highway, let's take this highway down south. Let's go to In-N-Out Burger. Has anyone ever had an In-N-Out Burger? Quite a few people. Some people say they're overrated. Um, you do not need to come talk to me afterwards. I don't even want to hear it. An In-N-Out burger is the greatest fast food burger in the world. Now, I know my family grew up in, like, Southern California, so we'd go down to visit. So there's, like, some nostalgia, right, related to that taste for me, too. Uh, I had already looked it up from where, from my house down to In-N-Out burger was 435 miles away. It was like, you know what, let's do it. So we're driving down, you know, it's like a good seven hour drive, whatever. Um, Realize, okay, I'm not going to school tomorrow. I do not endorse this, by the way, any of my students that are out here. It's like, I'm not going to school tomorrow. Uh, So we get there, it's like, oh, this is gonna be awesome. And it's like, you know, nine in the morning and they're not open yet. So I'm like, oh geez, what do we do now? So we kind of like kill some time and finally we're like waiting at the door at 10.30 when they open. And the guy's like, what are you guys doing here? Like, oh, we drove down from Portland to get burgers. He's like, okay, cool, come on in. So we come in, we get our burger. It's like, oh, this is amazing. We sit and talk for a little bit, and we're like, we're here. So we get another couple burgers, you know, to sit, and we're eating. I'm like, oh, this is great. Uh, I'm like, oh, shoot, I have to work, though, tonight. Like, I have to get back home to work. So we're driving back, and my stomach is full, like a solid three in and out burgers. Oh, the sun is like shining through the window. I don't know if you've ever been at this point where you're like driving and you could feel like you're like doing this, but your eyes are still fighting just to close, right? So we pull over, take a nap. It's like, okay, I think I'll be better now. Driving back, ooh, didn't help like I thought it would. And all of a sudden, bam, like there's an airbag in my face. Uh, I look back, my friend Pedro, who was sleeping on the back seat without a seatbelt on, is like flying forward. Um, the, something in the electrical system of the car goes off, and the horn is just, Bruh! I'm like, what is happening? Like, I was having the best nap of my life, and all of a sudden I'm woken up from it. And I look up, and we're in the back of an RV. Uh, I had the cruise control set at like 70 miles an hour, and it drifted to hit the car next to us. Thankfully, they were there, and I didn't just go off the road into who knows where. Um, I tell you that story because when I had fallen asleep at the wheel, I didn't, like, forget how to drive. I just stopped driving. And in our faith, uh, the same thing can happen, right? We can fall asleep at the wheel. It doesn't mean we've forgotten any of the good knowledge or wisdom or facts about what it means to be in relationship with God, but we just kind of stop living it out. Uh, if, and if you stop driving, bad things are going to happen. And when you stop actually living out your faith, bad things are going to happen. 
right? You might have all the right answers, especially if you like grew up in a Christian home or, you know, have been going to church for a while. You have all the right answers, like all the wisdom. Maybe people come to you for advice, right, about how to like, how to deal with this situation or about how to deal with something in your relationship with God and their relationship with God. And you might have all the answers and yet still be asleep at the wheel in some significant ways in your life. And I know this is possible because I've done it before, right? Like as a pastor, as a youth pastor, like I have all this great advice for people, all this like great insight from the word of God, but there are times or parts of my life at times that I'm just like asleep at the wheel and I just kind of stop living it out. We all do this. You can say all the right things. You can serve and help others do all the right things like externally and still just fall asleep at the wheel in your life with God and just kind of let that drift away into nothingness and then wonder why God feels so distant. See, if you leave your faith on cruise control, you are going to crash eventually. Unless all your knowledge and wisdom and all these things that you've learned have some effect in your actual life, it's not faith. That's what James is telling us. It's not real faith. It's dead faith if it just lives up here and doesn't come out. When tragedy comes, right, you might know all the right things to tell someone, like, oh, you've got to stay connected to God. You've got to talk to other people about what's going on. You should really go see a counselor. But if you don't do any of those things when tragedy comes in your life, it's kind of worthless. You know, like all that knowledge doesn't really help you unless you put it into action. Uh, You might know, maybe people come to you and say, like, hey, how do I stay connected to Jesus? And you've been that way before, so you know all the, like, oh, like, you should read this way, and you should pray this way, and all these things. But if you're not actually doing it on a weekly and daily basis, it's dead faith. It's just nothing. It's, It's a nice thought. It's great. It's good for other people, but it's kind of dead for you. You might know how to, like, if someone comes to you with anxiety or depression, like, know what you would say and what you should do and have all these answers about what faithfulness looks like. But unless you're willing to actually let those, that knowledge affect the way you live your life, it's dead. I'm doing premarital counseling with a a couple that I'm marrying. Um, And, you know, I've done it now a few times before. I've been married, like, 10 years. So sometimes I'll be, like, saying something. I'm like, oh, this is, like, great advice for them. And as I'm saying it, I'm like, oh, shoot. I haven't done this for a while. (laughs) Right? Like, if I'm not actually living it out myself, it's kind of worthless. Like, all that knowledge about how to have a healthy marriage doesn't really mean anything if I'm not putting any of it into practice. The same is true in our relationship with God. You have all the knowledge in the world, but if you're just kind of on cruise control and asleep at the wheel, it's worthless. So as we kind of wrap up today, maybe something has come up for you in the last uh, couple weeks as we've talked about this kind of idea, faith without works is dead, over and over. Do that. Like actually put it into practice this week. Figure out what that looks like. If you're kind of like not sure, here's a couple questions maybe to prompt some action. Because, you know, if you just walk away and be like, oh, wow, that was a great idea. Like you're doing the exact opposite thing of what James is telling us to do right now. So uh, in what way is your faith asleep at the wheel? Maybe it's kind of one area of your life. Maybe it's like one kind of thing. Like maybe it is your marriage or maybe it is in a friendship or maybe it is like in your quiet time. Maybe it is like in the way you're like serving the people around you, like whatever it is. And what would it look like to wake up this week? Spend some time asking God what that might be and try actually like stepping into it this week. So uh, I'm going to pray for us uh, and then uh, really want to encourage you that all of this stuff we talk about is dead and worthless if it doesn't work itself out in your life in some way. And, and when we do let it work itself out, when we do actually have this live faith, this living faith, it is so much more life-giving than all the dead faith in the world. Like, like just a little bit of action and working it out and being with Jesus is so much more life-giving than, knowing, than memorizing like, you know, 500 passages of Scripture. These things need to work themselves out in our life in order to experience the life that Jesus has promised us. Let me pray for us. God, thank you so much for your day, for this day that you, um, that you challenge us and you convict us and you try to to put a spotlight on areas of our life that need refining and that we need to wake up. 
So God, I just ask this week that you would help us to be aware of the areas that we're asleep at the wheel, the areas that we've, we've kind of just put things on cruise control, uh, where we're just drifting away from you. Uh, and God, help wake us up before we crash or before things get so far that we don't even want to bother trying to fix it. God, I just ask that you would help us to, uh, when we do take those steps this week, uh, that your spirit would be empowering us and we would be experiencing life in a fresh new way. Um, that you would, you would be faithful to follow through on the things you've promised us. Um, that we would uh, just experience your presence in maybe a way we haven't felt for a while. So God, we thank you so much for your love and your grace that even when we screw up week after week and year after year, you still have grace for us and you're waiting for us uh, to come back and to, and to connect with you. In your name we pray. Amen. Reminder, sign up for the blood drive. Go give Jody a big bear hug if you want to. And we'll see you later.